world has gone insane. Cosplayers rule the conventions, gamers dominate the tabletop, and the internet. Sci-fi subjugates the movies, and fantasy rules the bookstore with an iron fist. Only one group can bring order to this unruly mob. A team of uber geeks, masters of the nerdly arts, trained for decades in the hobby shops and basements of the nation. Mobilized by the secret masters, they are the Department of Nerdly Affairs. Hello, operatives, and welcome to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. I'm your host, Rob Patterson, here with my co-host, Don Chisholm. Who needs to learn how to write with his left hand. We'll talk about that later, Don. <laughs> and tonight, we're going to be talking about light novels with our very special guest, Sam Penansky, the president and founder of J Novel Club. Welcome to the show, Sam. Uh, hello, guys. How are, you, uh, how are you doing? We're doing great. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm uh, always glad to come and uh, spread the gospel of light novels, as they say. Preach, brother, preach. Okay. <laughs> so before we begin, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Sam? Sure. Um, so uh, I live here in Japan, at least uh, for another month or two. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, I've lived here actually for over 11 years now, and I have been uh, very deeply involved in the anime, manga, and now uh, novel industry here in Japan for um, basically almost the whole time I've been here. And mm -hmm. I started out as a translator of anime, uh, doing one of the very uh, first uh, official subtitles for simulcasts uh, when they started about seven, eight years ago. Uh, uh, and then mm -hmm. I've moved on to do localization and just sort of managing localization for all kinds of projects, whether it's anime or, or manga or even like variety shows and movies and uh, many other projects over the years. And then about two years ago, uh, maybe a little more, about two and a half years ago, I started uh, J Novel mm -hmm. Club, uh, mm -hmm. which is, of course, my business where we publish and uh, distribute English light novels worldwide. So. Uh, that's my basic background, but uh, before that, I had a PhD in theoretical physics and and did all kinds of other interesting stuff. So, <laughs> uh, well, I guess uh, I'm I'm doing I'm doing things in alternate universes that are a little less realistic now. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, physics are still involved, especially with all this isekai stuff going on and people traveling all over the universe. So that's right. If, I suppose <clears throat> if there's anyone who is more appropriate uh, to be publishing stories about multiple dimensions, it's someone whose thesis was all about that. <laughs> that is really amazing. So, so actually, take, let's take wow. a moment here and, and tell us: Are there actually multiple dimensions? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. I suppose you're you're asking me from a theoretical physics standpoint and not yes. a fiction standpoint. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not asking you. I'm not asking you if I can go and fight a demon lord in another reality. No. That's right. Well, um, one of the prevailing theories that, uh, of course, is out there, and what my what I actually studied is called string theory. And mm. one of the interesting things about string theory is that, from a very fundamental level, it requires more dimensions, more space time dimensions than the normal four dimensions that we observe in our current universe. Right. And so uh, mm. starting, I guess it's already 20 years now uh, ago or so, uh, scientists have started to actually research, well, what are the implications of that? What if the universe was actually, you know, 10 or 11 dimensional, right? And and it's an extremely interesting and complicated question. And, and effectively, that's sort of what my research was. So now mm. your question was, are there other dimensions? And mm. the simple answer is that we have no experimental evidence of that yet. <laughs> but right. there's lots of theoretical evidence, uh, or we wouldn't call it evidence, but theoretical uh, reasons why having more than four dimensions is interesting. And a lot of them have to do with sort of, uh, um, well, uh, the way... Uh, quantum field theory works. So I don't want to get too far into it, but basically if you have more dimensions, uh, you can uh, encase extra fields in extra parts of fields and other dimensions that are compactified in interesting ways and get rid of some theoretical problems that you run into if you're just talking about four dimensional stuff. So uh, right. that's sort of why some scientists believe that extra dimensions uh, is likely even if mm -hmm. we can't observe them yet because they're tiny little uh, compactified dimensions or because for some reason our matter is, is stuck into just the four dimensions that we can move. Uh, one interesting mm -hmm. theory that I personally like is that gravitons 
um, are actually able to move in all, say, 10 or 11 dimensions, uh, while the other particles are all stuck in the four-dimensional hyperplane that we see and observe. Right. And that's one of the explanations that can be used for why gravity is such so, so much weaker than all the other forces, because the particles that mediate gravity uh, are expanding all into all these 10 or 11 dimensions. And just like you know, light spreading out in four dimensions, it's a power law, right? Mm -hmm. So if you spread out over 11 dimensions, you're one over you know, uh, R to the whatever dimensions it is. So it'd be 11, and therefore it gets weaker much faster, right? So uh, there's lots of interesting cool. theoretical reasons reasons why having extra dimensions uh, that we just can't see and observe right now is uh, is can solve or at least help solve some of the uh, open questions uh, in physics but uh, like it or not unfortunately there has been absolutely no experimental evidence for such things yet so uh, there is a you know there's a reason why after i got my phd and did a postdoc i decided to change jobs right <laughs> Well, you know, being an expert in a field that you can't actually research is a bit of a problem. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I can see that. But, uh, I, I mean, hopefully someday we'll, we'll manage to prove it and scientists will be able to use uh, extra dimensions to uh, cheat the laws of physics and reality. <laughs> that would be cool. That's kind of interesting because um, isn't it in recent years they've actually been able to, they think, because it's, it's hard to rate that, but they've actually discovered evidence of uh of practical physical quantum entanglement uh right well quantum entanglement is is uh is definitely experimentally verified quite well in fact uh, uh i think mit i think it was mit uh, mm -hmm. basically took uh, two quantum entangled bits and then somehow i don't know exactly how they did it but they trucked one you know hundreds of miles away and they mm -hmm. did the classic you know measure one and the other one you know, has to mm -hmm. be linked to it after you measure the first one experiment, and it matched the the theory exactly. So, uh, yeah, no, quantum entanglement is extremely well um, uh, well confirmed experimentally at this point. And, well, quantum physics in general is one of probably the most confirmed theories ever. So right. <laughs> your computer wow. itself wouldn't work unless quantum physics was, you know, exactly right <laughs> to an, an incredible amount of precision. Wow. So does that mean we could use quantum entanglement to like create communication devices where we were literally both are producing the same information at the same time? So two different places, people can like instant, basically instant communication and nope. instant compute. What? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, no, exactly. Okay. Not at, not at all. In fact, quantum entanglement uh, explicitly does not violate causality because if you oh. could do that, then you're, transfer, trans, then you're transmitting information great, faster than the speed of light. It's one mm -hmm. of the classic paradoxes of, of uh, quantum physics that uh, you learn about in sort of uh, college-level quantum physics. So I suggest um, uh, go reading up on that if you're curious of how quantum entanglement ends up not breaking the, uh, uh, the, mm -hmm. the uh, causality principle. It's because... You, you you can't essentially it's because you can't actually transmit the 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 person on the other end can't know that you've done the experiment until you communicate that to them so right <laughs> if they look at it before whoever looks at it first basically is the one who sets the value so you can't actually use it to transmit information you can it, it does it is true that that it seems like it would do that because all of a sudden instantaneously two things from very large distances are suddenly fixed into a certain state, but the way it works, it, you it's impossible to actually transmit any information that way. And there's an interesting proof about that that uh, you can look up, look it up. Oh wow! Okay, and we wandered way off track. Um, actually, <laughs> Welcome to the what's... physics podcast. So physics aside, okay, let's let's move on to the physics our audience actually probably is more interested in, which is um, you know alternate realities, as we said, in fighting demon lords. So how exactly did you fall into the business of uh, translating light novels, Sam? Well, uh, that's a good question. And about two years ago, when I sort of uh, started creating the business, it was really actually about two and a half years ago now, uh, when I sat down and, and uh, really made the business plan and started uh, actually creating the business, that I thought to myself, uh, well, this is a market this is a bit of media anime manga uh, otaku media you could say that is really being underserved in the english community right so 
until maybe well, until only about eight years ago, there wasn't even any official way to watch anime from Japan. You know, anytime soon after mm-hmm. it aired in it, it aired in Japan, uh, the only way was through uh, uh, fan translations or uh, or actually being in Japan, basically, and watching it on yep. TV, right? But then, very very quickly, that rapidly sort of almost everything that's aired in Japan is now has some kind of official outlet. Maybe there's some delay, but you know, almost any anime that airs in Japan now is being officially streamed somehow. And at the same time, uh, there over the basically maybe a little bit earlier even manga uh, also you know there's a large amount of english manga that, that was being published and although there was a bit of a dip there on 2009 2010 um it's really back and there are large sections of manga and all the bookstores you know in the us and other ink other english speaking countries so there's really plenty of manga that was available however there's an entire third section third sort of mm-hmm. um, category of uh, uh, media that appeals to the same audience in japan uh, light novels and many right. of your favorite anime and, uh, or even manga are actually based off them, like for example, Sword Art Online, or uh, you know, it's probably the the biggest hit that uh, uh, that really pushed light novels awareness in the U.S. recently. And before that, there's also the uh, uh, Haruhi, the Suzumi Haruhi. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, of course, more recently, you have shows like Konosuba, um, right now airing Goblin Slayer, uh, yeah. one of the ones we do uh, in Another World with our smartphone, for example. Mm-hmm. So there's all these anime that are coming out, and People would watch them and be like, well, I want to know what happens next. Or or I heard this is based off a book or something. Mm-hmm. And people would be like, well, what's that? And they'd go online and they'd realize that there's this, you know, volume 30 of something out there. And there was no translation. There's no way for them to, to buy it. So uh, what I observed essentially two years ago is that there was an ever-growing, increasing number of uh, fan translations of these light novels out there. And I sort of, it reminded me of what I saw in the industry right before Crunchyroll went legit around 2005, 2006, mm-hmm. uh, where I was actually originally a fan subber uh, and had my own fan sub group back in the day. <laughs> oh, wow. And so I was very, uh, and so I was very sort of keen on what the, the overall situation was. Uh, and I saw, I saw what looked like a similar uh, situation except with these light novels and i thought to myself well someone needs to you know put these out officially and mm. can i do it uh, and the answer is that i had all the tools that i needed to do it because of my background so before two years ago i had been working in localization so i had worked for a lot of japanese companies and running localization groups and i had a group of translators and editors who i'd worked with for years uh, as well as just sort of the connections with the japanese industry the publishers the uh, tv stations and some of the anime production companies and so i could get introductions to the publishers and and try and uh, license content from them so i can license the content i can do the localizations and i'm able to program them the website and everything pretty much by myself as with my CS degree from Carnegie Mellon. And that's exactly what I did. I was like, I can do this. I can build this business uh, pretty much with the tools I have. And there's a market need out there. So let's do it. So I know that's kind of a dry answer. Like, I mean, maybe you were looking more towards like, oh, I just fell in love with light novels and I just had to, you know, work on them because that's, the, you know, I love light novels so much. But it was kind of more of a, I want to serve the fan audience that I've been serving right. for years, right? I, I, I've been, I've not just been a fan for many years, right? I've been sort of in the industry helping to produce the content in one way or the other. And it's really an extension of that is what caused me to start the business. Right, right. Okay, no, no, that's, I yeah. I, I was looking for just your general answer about why you got into <laughs> this and, uh, and how this happened, because obviously you have some love of Japanese culture, because there you are. Um, actually, can I ask just quick, one quick side note? Why did you go to Japan? Was it to because you were in love with Japanese culture, or was there some other reason? Well, uh, the, my sort of origin story is interesting, I think. Uh, I was a graduate student in theoretical physics uh, at University mm-hmm. of California, Santa Barbara. And during my college and then also graduate, uh, when I was a grad student, I sort of got into anime just because uh, uh, I had some friends that were into it and I thought it was cool. Mm-hmm. And it was your basic, uh, oh, Evangelion is the coolest thing ever kind of right. fan. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then in grad school, I one day, I think it was my first year in grad school, I was reading this manga called Narutaru, which um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Bokurano or Mohiro Kito. He's the name of the mangaka. Um, He was constantly writing stories about like young children dying horrible heart and horrible ways. Um, (laughs) It's uh, that. He's not the one who wrote Grave of the Fireflies, is he? No, no, he's not that one. Um, But, uh, 
In any case, there, there was a manga called Naritaru, <laughs> which was published in the U.S. by a company called Dark Horse, which maybe you're familiar with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, However, they didn't realize that how incredibly dark it got by and by volume seven. Basically, there it it was so bad that like they they published it, serialized it in something called Super Manga Blast, but they had to cut out about sixteen pages. Like wow. that was oh. like and and of course after that they just stopped publishing it. And I wanted to read the rest of it. I was mm. like, <laughs> what happens next? So I imported the books from Japan. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever done that. I I, I bought the Japanese versions, and then I mm-hmm. sat and tried to stare at them, and was like, "Well, how hard? It can't be harder than string theory." Is sort of what I naively uh-huh. thought at the time. And uh, and I got I bought some dictionaries. I sat down and started trying to piece through the these these the, the Japanese by myself with no real training. And mm-hmm. after about a, a couple of weeks of attempting to do that, I realized, "Hey, why don't I just take courses while I'm a grad student at <laughs> University of Santa Barbara? That would be easy, right?" And so mm-hmm. I did. And it was really fun and great and it was sort of my hobby while I was a grad student for the next 3 years was to do some fan subbing and learn Japanese and that was the that was the other thing I was studying studying instead of just purely physics. Mm. Um, and when I was about to get my PhD, I had a choice of postdocs, and I decided actually to uh, take a postdoc in Japan. So oh. to answer your question, how did I come to Japan? The answer is that I actually did a postdoc at the University of Tokyo for two years. I was a Japanese Society for Promotion of Science fellow. Hmm. Wow. And so I continued doing some research here in Japan, and then after the two years were up, basically I was like, well, I could apply for more postdocs, or I could figure out a way to stay here in this country that I like living in and still need to improve my Japanese. And that just perfectly timed up with the uh, beginning of Crunchyroll and when they Mm -hmm. went legit, and I became one of their sort of uh, first simulcast uh, subtitle translators at the time. And Mm -hmm. shortly after I sort of went more independently freelance and started getting work directly with the Japanese companies. So did you need a sponsor at that point? I mean, for, to, to work and stay in Japan. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very good, good, uh, good question. So Jap- Japan visas are pretty strict about work requirements and sponsors, right? Yes, they are. So when I first came to Japan, uh, as this postdoc, I was actually under a very strange visa. I forget even what it's called, but it's like a, it's like a visa where for studying under a master like you're, it's okay. not a work visa. Ooh. It was very mm. screwy. Like I got paid as a postdoc, but I was not paid a salary. I was paid a travel reimbursement for two years. Huh. <laughs> but that's <laughs> so, that's why I don't have to pay taxes on it to the Japanese right. government. So it's their oh, own money. Good. It's their own money. So what they're like, why are we taxing our own grant? Right. So I, right. that kind of makes sense. But then after that, after my postdoc was over, I actually had a about three months where it was pretty iffy. Um, uh, but uh, before the time limit, I got actually a job at Tezuka Productions. So I don't know if you're familiar with Tezuka, but, you know, the father yes. of Astro Boy, the, yeah. the of creator, you know. So his uh, production company, uh, which is still owned by his family, it's owned by his son and daughter, um, mm-hmm. uh, still sort of maintains all of his works and licenses them. And the uh, uh, general manager of Tezuka uh, is a very forward-thinking person, and he is also very um, was very influential in the anime in the anime industry as one of the people from the Association of Japanese Animation Companies. Uh, and he mm-hmm. kind of took me under his wing and provided me a contract, which is super important, uh, and mm-hmm. sponsored my visa. And basically, the first two and three years or so, while I was doing freelance translation, I was doing it effectively um, underneath Tezuka Production. So I was acting independently, but they they were the ones who actually paid me money. So that's the way I sponsored my visa for the first three years. Holy smokes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Kind of getting in at the top floor there. Holy cow. <laughs> Well, you'd you'd be surprised how how small uh, and actually kind of a similarly still like family run business Tezuka Productions is. It's really only about the production. It, it, the actual office is in a old uh, remodeled like school, uh, like mm-hmm. a little mini like a juku. So it's only like three floors, and there's about maybe eight eight little offices and probably about twenty employees in there, and that's it. And then they have a whole studio. In, you know, they actually have an animation studio, of course, and that's in a separate uh, part of town. But that even that is also not really very large. So uh, it's very you know historic, but it's really just a small number of people. 
See, that's that's so weird. That's like finding out the head of Disney Studios is working out of his basement just three houses down from where I live kind of thing. Yeah, Tezuka never really got to that. Uh, he never did that. Like, e- even his office in the animation studio is still preserved the way it used to be. And I am I was, you know, sort of, uh, they let, they showed me <laughs> it, which is kind of special. It's not something that's open mm-hmm. to the public. Uh, and it was really quite an amazing treasure trove. There's, you know, uh, signed pictures from Walt Disney sent to Tezuka on the wall, <laughs> things like that. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah, I bet it. Wait, so is it? Then they just wander and dust it once a day. I mean, it's just all sitting there exactly as it was when he died. Yeah, well, I'm not exactly, but close to it. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little wow, weird. I, I. It's actually a little weird. I, I had that thought too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's that. Wait. Did Tezuka die in his office, or did he actually die in the hospital? I'm not sure about that. I'll have to have to go go to the books on that one. But he definitely died from effectively just working too much. Like, That's like what I, I think thought. everybody. Yeah, I mean, the man produced so much work over so like he. I think he he had produced something like 400 or 500 different manga over his yeah. lifetime i mean and that's you know the 20 or 30 a year i don't even want to think about how many pages it was <laughs> but yeah. um uh yeah he just worked and worked and worked he worked i mean he died relatively young but he did you know 10 times the work output of a normal person so one can only think yeah. you know uh what what would have happened if he had if he had uh, uh stayed alive well yeah, yeah exactly that's yeah that, yeah he's fantastic as as I recall, I do believe he he did die in the hospital. Um, the legend is that his last words were essentially, "For the love of God, please let me get back to work." Yeah, I'm sure that's what he, I'm sure that's what he was thinking if he was in the hospital and like, "Is it please just give me a pen?" You know, mm-hmm. that's the way yep. he was. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I can I can totally see that. Well, wow, that, that's that's truly amazing. So so. Mm-hmm. Have you been using your connections then with Crunchyroll as part, because you obviously still have some, as part of uh, doing your business as well? With, with uh, Does J Novel have any connections with Crunchyroll at this point? Um, well, actually, since uh, most of the people I dealt with, this was in early days of Crunchyroll, uh, they've mm-hmm. all moved on after the Crunchyroll sold, to, to, uh, sold out to um, AT&T. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. actually, the people at Crunchyroll are, are basically completely different. Oh, okay, okay. Hmm, interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, actually, I didn't know Crunchyroll was owned by AT and T. Well, originally they were by the Churnin Group, and then it, it, you can look it up. But uh, uh, they they right. sold out to the Churnin Group, uh, uh, which is I guess like more already five six years ago. And then AT and T recently, I think over the past year, uh, bought out the rest of the shares of uh, the Churnin Group that conglomeration called Otter Media, which is uh, runs Elation, which is the parent company of Crunchyroll. So it's very complicated. Wow, that is, um, oh, wow. Okay, I, all I know is I subscribe to Crunchyroll and I watch cartoons, and that's about it. Yeah, they don't really <laughs> advertise all the corporate stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, we should probably get back on track then. Um, so, so then, what was the first light novel that uh, your company did? Sure. Uh, well, uh, when. I started out uh, with this company, of course, when starting any brand new company like this, and especially one that had a business model like we do, which I can get into in a second, that mm-hmm. no one had actually tried before, uh, it's really a high bar to go to a Japanese publisher and say, hey, give us your content. We're a company that's never actually published anything, and you have no idea whether <laughs> we're trustworthy or not. <laughs> and oh, by the way, we're going to try this business model that no, no one has ever attempted before as well. Uh, please, right. you know, trust us. Uh, that's a that's a high bar, right? But thankfully, I had connections with uh, Kodansha and also um, uh, number, like other publishers like Tezuka, although they don't publish like mm-hmm. novels, but they were able to you know, help me give me some introductions. And two of the companies that were sort of were the ones who I licensed content from first uh, were Hobby mm-hmm. Japan and Overlap. Uh, and oh. those are both smallish uh, publishers in Japan. Hobby Japan publishes a bunch of uh, hobby magazines. So mm-hmm. they'll publish like uh, magazines about uh, Gunpla uh, and uh, like military like replica stuff and 
airsoft guns and but they also have a light novel line which is actually fairly old it's been around for about 10 years now they had their 10th 10 year anniversary i think last year and meanwhile mm -hmm. overlap is a almost very new company they've only been around for five years um and they actually were founded by some people from media factory uh who uh sort of split off from Kata when media factory got bought by katakawa and uh mm -hmm. they just started publishing sort of only about three or four years ago so they didn't have as much of a catalog but they're also a small lean and new company so both of these mm -hmm. companies basically were willing to take a risk on me uh, because, uh, well, they they had less at stake, I guess you could say. You know, they're new companies mm -hmm. and they're willing to go out on a limb on these sorts of things. So the first uh, books that we actually uh, published, some of our first announcements, probably the biggest one and one of the bigger successes that we've had is Grimgar of Fantasy and Ash. Uh, that is, uh, and the print release is being put out by Seven Seas right now, but we're already up to mm -hmm. volume 11 in our ebooks. Right. And that is a great uh, fantasy uh, series. It's it's isekai, but it's almost more just pure fantasy. And what's really interesting about it is unlike other, the other series where the main characters are overpowered or, or there's mm -hmm. lots of you know fun and shenanigans, uh, this series is just really, really intense the whole time and, and tense. It's not just intense, it's tense because the right. the characters are thrown into this RPG world, but they have no skills, not really, and they're sort of the lowest tier. They don't really have any powers at all. They're just mm. trying desperately to survive in a world that is trying desperately to kill them. And uh, plenty of them don't survive. So it's one of those who's going to die? Please don't let my favorite character die, you know, sort of mm. tensions. And then even if they do survive, you know, just the trauma that they that they undergo is is, is serious in the, in the series. So uh, it's a great read and, and it just right. you, you blow through it because of so of how tense it is and so that was one of our very first announcements and that was sort of the big big one we did uh, at the other uh other some of the other sort of initial books that we uh licensed um mm -hmm. although we didn't announce it immediately but they were licensed already was uh our biggest hit uh how a realist hero rebuilt the kingdom uh yes. which is also from uh overlap and that one has just been a huge success that's uh uh, another isekai story about a, a guy transported to another world. In this case, he's summoned to another world as like the the hero to defeat the demon lord. But mm -hmm. instead of actually going and defeating the demon lord, he looks at it and goes, you know, how about I, you know, help uh, your kingdom's financial situation? Then you can just pay mm -hmm. off that empire that's trying to force you to, to send a warrior. And you don't have to worry about this whole defeating the demon lord thing. You can let the empire deal with that. And uh, the king basically looks at this guy and they go, he goes and, you know, shows him his books and uh the and the, after about like a day the king is like okay you're the king now mm. <laughs> <laughs> and and basically the story starts off like that and it's great because it's yeah. not really uh so much i mean there's plenty of action and battles and actually some cool um uh, military uh, strategy mm -hmm. in the books two and three and five and six but it's mostly administrative and also a uh, fun uh, collection of sort of talent. Uh, there's a lot of uh, girls. It is a harem kind of mm -hmm. thing, so he gets lots of wives. But uh, uh, they're all actually good individual characters with their own sort of uh, uh, problems and uh, and personalities. So it's a great series that combines, I think, well, some of the better aspects of the more um, kingdom-building type right. uh, isekai cool. series that are out there. Oh yeah, I'm a huge fan of Realist Hero. I, oh great! Uh, I, I, I've read them, and yeah, I, I love them. I really do. Um, for exactly the reason you said, and I, what I love is basically about how it goes in all different directions. Like how food is a major aspect of the story, and uh, because the kingdom—that's just a slight spoiler. This kingdom is also undergoing a famine, so one of the things he has to overcome is a famine, and he uses many creative solutions to to overcome famine and the famine and everything. It's it's actually really great. Mm -hmm. I really like the fa I really like Pancho, uh, mm -hmm. one of the one of the characters uh, yeah. who's you know you, he seems at first sort of maybe like a cliched you know overweight like joke character, but right, in yeah. the end he's the one who saves the day like half the time because yeah. uh, yeah. I think uh, well I don't want to spoil it you're right I, I won't tell you how he spoils the food <laughs> how they uh, well I don't they didn't spoil the food it's the opposite in fact but yeah, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> it, what what he's alluding to is that Pancho is basically kind of the food master if you call him of the story. Uh, not the hero, but he's one of his uh, supporters who's a expert on food. And that's, uh, yeah, it, it's it's great. Oh, yeah. No, no. Realist hero. Anyone listening to this, if there's any book you want to start with in the J novel collection, this is that's my personal recommendation is Realist Hero. There's lots of great stuff, but that's my personal recommendation. And um, Volume 8 is coming out in Japan in 
Oh, it actually came out three days ago as we were recording this. Oh, so okay. by the time by the time this podcast goes live, uh, we should mm -hmm. have started uh, putting up Volume Eight on our site by then. That's fantastic. Well, everyone should go out and check out Volume One to start with, but then Eight's waiting for you, folks. So go grab it. Hmm. Okay. So, um, so those were some of your like first big hits and obviously that gave you a real boost and so that gave you uh more credit with the other um with the other companies basically to start like getting more and more licenses yeah uh, that's how it works right when you uh, show success and and maybe not just financial success but just consistency uh that you know you can do the job and and mm. put out content that's good quality uh that's really what will get you in the door um of course you know uh, negotiations it's always a negotiation and some companies have different requirements than others some companies for example are like we don't really need care as much about how much money you pay us up front but we want a higher royalty rate and then other companies will say you know well i don't you know royalty rate can be lower but you got to guarantee us you know x amount so every publisher is different mm -hmm. and uh, and especially some publishers can be uh, just take a long time to to sort of work its way through their internal deliberations but once you get your foot in the door you know, with a series, one series or mm -hmm. two series, then after that, uh, you build a relationship and the trust is there. Uh, and you really can sort of pick and choose whatever you want from the catalog as long as you're, you know, you're not getting outbid by the competition. Right, right. Hmm. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about your business model that you mentioned, this uh, this untested, untried model that seems to actually <laughs> be working pretty well. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Jane Novel Club actually is two businesses in one, or two business models. So mm -hmm. as I, I think we've talked about so far, we're a digital publisher, and so we publish mm -hmm. eBooks, and we publish them on Amazon, iBooks, Nook, Kobo, uh, Google Play, uh, as well as Bookwalker, uh, which is sort of mm -hmm. specialized anime, manga, and light novel store. Uh, and we also even put them up in Overdrive, which is uh, for libraries, and basically every other um, uh, eBook store that that is at least mildly uh, mm -hmm. popular out there that we can. And that's a really the basis of the fundamental part of our business. But at the same time, we also have a subscription service. So you can become a Jane Novel Club member and for four ninety five a month, and uh, go ahead and put the price out there. And basically by that membership is like you can read any novel that we are currently translating on our website. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so basically... There's, uh, you can read like the latest novels then as they're being translated and before we've published the ebook. So basically every week our translators and editors will upload a new part of a volume, the, whatever the latest thing they've translated. So for example, for Realist Hero volume eight in a couple of weeks, when we start that one, uh, part one will go up on our website and our members can read that. And then next week they can read part two, part three, etc. Mm -hmm. We usually split volumes into eight or 10 parts. It uh, depends on how long they are. And you can read them on our app or our website, as long as you're a subscriber. Then after mm -hmm. the parts are finished being serialized on, on our website, uh, we do some final proofreading. We do some checking and we publish them as eBooks. And when that happens, then you can't read those books on the website anymore, but you can read the next volume, which we've already started usually, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how it basically works. It's like if you're comparing it to Crunchyroll or an anime or any like an anime streaming site, it's like a simulcast only subscription, you could say, uh, for oh. novels. Uh, and there's another one extra thing that you can do as well, which sort of combines the two models. You can actually become a premium member, and that's ten ninety five a month. And what that gets you is the same thing as being a member plus a free credit every month for for uh, an ebook. So that's an uh, extra six bucks a month. So you basically get $1 off our normal retail price of $7 uh, every month for a free ebook that you can download directly from our website. So uh, that's sort of a perk that you can choose if, you, uh, if you're already buying more than 12 volumes a year, uh, then it's mm. uh, going to save you some money. That's interesting. How did you come up with this like idea? Was this a model that you'd seen some version of somewhere else? Or how, how do you come up with this? Well, it's a good question. So the philosophy behind this model is actually fairly detailed. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, remember, the the impetus for creating Jane Novel Club in the beginning was that I was seeing the increase in fan translation and fan translation consumption of light novels. And now, mm -hmm. fan translation groups uh, will release the light novels not one volume at a time. 
they release them every week or every other week or every chapter, right? And so people are used to reading these things online in parts and more continuously. Secondly, uh, it takes, you know, a couple months to one, two months, maybe minimum to translate a whole volume. So if you release just a volume at a time, there's this large gap between volumes. And as anyone who does any internet sort of advertising knows, there's you, the more frequency you have to the adver advertisement, the more mm -hmm. social interaction you have, the more uh, sort of uh, social media enhancement you get to a title's popularity. So by releasing much more frequently, in this case weekly, uh, we are constantly sort of refreshing the IP for each of these novels and getting people talking about it or getting people anticipating it, right, every week. That's the way right. anime works, right? They, they, you know, anime is aired every week, so we're trying to copying that format for the subscription part of the service. But that alone is is insufficient because these are books and they're designed to be read one volume at a time. Uh, and there and there are many, many, many people out there who, especially if you want to purchase the the books, are not going to be satisfied with just a subscription. So uh, we needed to do both models at the same time, and that's how we sort of cover uh, basically as much of the audience as possible. Now to go off on a slight tangent here, mm -hmm. um, in July we actually announced at Anime Expo that we're going to be putting out our own print editions. Of of some of our books as well, which you may have heard of. And yes. that actually, it was, I mean, I never said this publicly at the time, but that was always part of the plan, right? Uh, and so by putting out print books, um, all as is the final leg of the, st of the stool of the way people consume novels, right? There are the people who want to watch, you know, read it online every week, like a streaming thing. There's the people who want to have the eBooks and put them on their e-readers or their tablets. And then there's the people who just want to hold them in their hands and, and, you know, curl up on a bench on the beach somewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And by having all three of those models simultaneously uh, being published, that is how we truly cover the whole audience. Wow. That's, that's pretty slick. Cause I find, um, what a lot of uh, publishers of different kinds of media nowadays seem to think is either you stick to the traditional print or you go straight digital and they kind of end up, they'll favor one and then maybe half ass kind of the other, but that's pretty slick that you've thought that out to, to, to appeal to, yeah, anybody, however it is they want to consume the product kind of thing. I mean, I have actual survey data that mm -hmm. shows an almost, three-way split. It's like 30%, 30%, 40%, 30% between people who only care about digital or in people who only care about print and people who will do one or the other or both, right? And so yeah. if you just, you know, you focus on one side or the other too much, you're, you're missing all of that audience. And now, of course, the question is, you know, can you do one or the other in a cost-efficient way at the levels that we're talking about? And obviously, we're not going to be doing all of our books in print because of that. Many of our books that are digital only are going to stay that way because they just don't sell enough copies to make print a viable uh, option. But we're going to basically do anything in print that is financially viable, I guess you could say. Right. Hmm. Now, for the uh, for the ones that that um, don't hit the numbers for a proper print release, did you ever think of uh, print on demand? That's a interesting question, and actually, because our distributor is Ingram, uh, they have an extremely robust print on demand uh, capability, but. The problem with print on demand on light novels is the color images in the front. So if you've uh -huh. uh, if you're looking at a light novel, you'll see that almost all of them have three, four, five color plates in the front, maybe two landscape and two two mm -hmm. portrait, um, mm -hmm. and then and it uh, and that those sort of color images are part of the major value of the book, right? And if you do print on demand, uh, as far as I know, no print on demand systems can do uh, mixed paper types like that. So unfortunately, it's not possible to produce the night light novels properly in print on demand unless we turn those into black and white, which I don't mm -hmm. think is acceptable. I know some manga publishers will take the color pages and just print them in black and white, and people don't seem to care that much about that for some reason. But <laughs> I think my I think I know my audience well enough to know that that would be unacceptable. So uh, our print is actually going to be relatively high quality. We're going. We're going maybe slightly more expensive than the competition in a smaller format, but with higher mm -hmm. quality paper. So uh, we're, I think I, I, rather than go towards the just try and cheap out as much as possible, we're going to sort of differentiate even more on the print and make it worth the people's money to, to collect it. Yeah, I could, 
Yeah, I can see that because a lot of the um, the print on demand stuff that I've seen that that does try to replicate the color plates, it ends up looking muddy. Hmm. I mean, we could do color, but the problem is, is that you'd have you'd have to pay for color for the entire book, even though most yeah. of it is just black and white, and it's uh, prohibitive. It it would cost yeah. more than it would. We'd have to retail price those like twenty five dollars or something, which is not acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then again, your average paperback book these days is like $15 or something like that at this point. So yeah, our books will actually be priced at 14.99. So that's correct. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So there we go. Yeah. No, no, that's perfect. Um, so to pivot slightly then, so since you mentioned statistics earlier in that, so, so I have a question then. So how does late novel readership in Japan differ from late novel readership in English? Do you have any knowledge of that? Well, data as to the actual light novel readership in Japan is generally not public. I mean, we we see mm-hmm. sales figures, um, right. and I there is definitely uh, some series which are more popular in English than they you would think they would be based off the popularity in Japan. For example, mm-hmm. um, I I personally see that uh, actually, I mean, this is. Uh, there, there's a group of readers in Japan, of light novel readers in Japan, which are sort of older and mm-hmm. seasoned. Uh, they're the kinds of readers that will go out and buy uh, Kino no Tabi or, Bo- or Boogie Pop or those sort of classic light novels. Um, mm-hmm. And those people don't – that – those people exist in the West, but are much, much smaller in size, like maybe like 100 mm. people. Um, right. Because – and when you think about it, it's just sort of obvious, right? Uh, their light novels have been a, have been published in Japan now for 20, 30 years, uh, and there's a long history of them and people who grew up on them or uh, or have read them for a long time. So there's just a much larger uh, you know, body of experience with the media. But I'm um, at the medium. But however, in the West, it's really only been in the past couple of years that uh, that light novels have been officially published at all. So uh, there is just it hasn't had the time to grow this sort of stable core of readers mm-hmm. that would maybe be helpful to sustain some of the classic titles that you see, right, right. which is one of mm-hmm. some of the reasons I think some of the classic titles struggle, right? On the other hand, the, you know, the new hip isekai stuff, uh, the fun books, like a lot of the books that we publish, like in another world with our smartphone, for example, mm-hmm. um, or another big hit that we just, uh, started, uh, you know, the arch demons dilemma, how to love your elf bride, right? Mm-hmm. Um, these, mm-hmm. those sorts of, uh, fun uh, stories and and lighthearted stories uh, really sell well in the West. They sell well in Japan as well. And I think it's actually the the younger people, the audience uh, of the younger people is almost the same in the West and Japan. I think those readers' tastes are really not very different at all at this point. Uh, I think it also goes for anime too. Like the right. if you're under if you're under 25 and you're an anime fan in America or under 25 and an anime and an anime fan in Japan, you're not actually so different from each other these days. But once you get older than like the 25s, then it starts to diverge a little bit because of uh, you know because. Ten years ago, it was actually a very different experience between the West and the East, but not anymore. Right. Mm. Well, speaking of those, so I, I don't. If this is proprietary, you you know obviously don't have to tell me or anything like that. But I'm curious as what your demographics are like for like J Novo Club. Are like how old are most of your readers? Mm-hmm. Well, I can. I'm happy to to share some of the basic information like that. Uh, so our readers' uh, median is around 22. 23 mm-hmm. um and there's and then there's a very it's a fairly like large spread upwards through to about like 35 and then mm-hmm. a tail you know we have a couple of people in their 60s but <laughs> right, right it's sort of a large tail however on the younger side of the spectrum we really get a severe drop off around 16 and mm-hmm. 15 so we don't really have too many younger kids like like people below the age of 14 almost nobody um right. but the uh, people uh, uh you know maybe because we need a credit card to sign up for a service right, yeah. card, <laughs> uh, we don't offer any sort of uh, any like free account or anything but mm-hmm. uh that seems to be our demographics and the female male ratio is unfortunately i mean i haven't actually checked this i think it's improved because of some of the content we licensed uh but it's uh, somewhere around i think uh, 25% 75% Right. Okay, that would wait. Seventy five percent is male, I'm assuming. Yes. I figured I figured I didn't need to be specific on that. And... Yeah, yeah, you know, I just I just wanted to double check there. Um because I, and that's actually you know, this is that's oddly good and I'll tell you why. Um you may or may not know this, but in North America we have a bit of a problem. This, it's been going on for quite some time, so you probably do know this actually, that usually about the age of twelve or thirteen, boys just stop reading. 
they basically, like, if you look at the reading charts for readership charts, the boys literally just disappear. They just literally drop off at, at about 13, 14 or so. And then maybe they'll come back in, like, in their 20s or something like that. But they base, there's this huge gap. And in among North American publishers and that, they've been really struggling because they're like, we they want to target this demographic, but this demographic doesn't read. Whereas girls... That's the whole well, you know, YA novel industry is basically written by girls for girls for the most part because they read voraciously. Their numbers just shoot up at that point. But it's interesting that you say that, that you're, you, know, you start to get some around 16, 17 because that means that you're actually getting boys reading. You're actually getting that male audience that normally in North American stuff normally just stops reading. Well, one thing to say is that those numbers are for worldwide. Right. right. Okay. So uh, I have, you know, if we wanted to drill down, I could see whether actually just looking at North America cuts off even more of, you know, of the younger readers that are male. Right. So um, that's an interesting question. And of course, that's also for the, that's also both male, female combined, right? So mm -hmm. right. Okay. <laughs> they, yeah, you, that. That, that doesn't necessarily prove that we have a, a significant that number of uh, under 20 that's... male readers. Uh, we'll have to actually look into the data for that, which I won't talk about specifically, ma mainly because it would take me a little while to do the cross tabs. But... Mm. <laughs> Uh, well, but no, interesting I've... point. I, I think actually that though our our content uh, is perfect for the purpose of maybe keeping or getting uh, younger teens, uh, younger male teens uh, reading again or reading books. I, I know that a lot of them, you know, watch anime, watch anime, obviously, mm -hmm. right? And if you're yeah. watching anime and enjoying it, it's uh, it, honestly it it's not actually a much of a higher bar to then go and, and read light novels and enjoy them, right? Not everybody's going to want to read. I mean, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's the way the world works yeah, these days. Uh, but mm -hmm. because many of our novels really sort of just, you know, they read like an anime and they're, they have the same excitement and the same kind of humor and the same uh, cool concepts. So uh, it's hard to say that, oh, if, you know, if you, if you, if you like My Hero Academia, then, you know, you're not going to like light novels. In fact, it's the opposite, right? I mean, I think that's, uh, uh, it's definitely much, much more likely that you would enjoy light novels if you're already a fan of that kind of stuff. Now, kind of uh, playing on that, do you think that there are audiences uh, that would enjoy the kind of materials that you're putting out, but aren't aren't exposed to them out there. Or? Good question. Uh, uh, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that it the question is a little bit vague because we publish a really wide variety of stuff. Uh, so mm -hmm. if I can talk about some of the other things sure. that we're publishing, like uh, we've published recently a book called Last and First Idol, which is you'd think, oh, it's like some idol thing, right? But no, it's actually extremely hard sci-fi. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the winner of the 2017 Seiyun Award for Best Sci-Fi Short Story in Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. amazingly enough, it was originally a, a doujin story about love live. <laughs> so wow. uh it Wait, combined what does, that, what does that mean you better what does that mean that let me explain sorry. that yeah so uh, are you maybe you've heard of a uh anime called love live um and it's also it's an idol anime uh it's got a ton of cute girls and they want to be the best idols and they're they want to save their school by being idols anyway came out a couple mm -hmm. of years ago and has multiple sequels and is super popular the concerts the uh there's a uh, mobile games there's all kinds of, it's a whole franchise at this point right uh mm -hmm. by bandai and some other people and so so, uh, of course, like any idol franchise, people have their own shipping of the characters, right? And mm -hmm. there is a partic two particular characters. There's one character uh, named, uh, uh, well, uh, Nico, uh, who is tries really, really, really hard in a way which is kind of cringy, and she's a meme kind of, of uh, in and of herself. Uh, and this author basically made a fan fiction about her and another character. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, uh, well, Nico Maki, I believe, is the, <laughs> is the other character. And <clears throat> excuse me and mm -hmm. basically wrote this and originally published it actually in a doujin event for love live so uh you know they have these like comic it they have these smaller events for for pre where people sell their fan fictions of stuff right, in japan right. mm -hmm. and he started off in his college circle and put out this story and it sort of got um it literally sort of got infamous immediately <laughs> And mm -hmm. what he did is he went back and rewrote it and changed the names and made it a little bit more original and fixed it up and submitted it to the to the like the highest pre most prestigious science fiction award in Japan. It's like the Hugos, right? Right. And then won. Oh. <laughs> wow. So uh, now, if you if you actually read the story, you'll see why uh, it's it's 
truly, truly insane. I don't want to incredibly spoil it, but the name itself, Last and First Idol, is a reference to Olaf Stevelson's 1904 masterpiece, Last and First Men. Okay. How, how, how deep into the woods are you guys in terms of classic sci-fi? Which is a, uh, well, the, the original one that's sort of a playoff of is a story told from the perspective of the ninth race of human beings three billion years in the future being transmitted to the reader through some kind of time travel device that they've invented, mm -hmm. relying the entire history of human civilization over eight different possible species. And that <laughs> is, that's almost tame compared to what happens in Last and First Idol. Jesus. <laughs> so, and, and the book itself actually has three short stories: the titular one, and then two other ones. One called Evolution Girls, and one called uh, Dark Seiyu. And the, both of them also combine otaku themes with super hard sci-fi. So, the second mm -hmm. one, Evolution Girls, either you play mobile games like Fate no. Go or or Dragon or any of those where you know where you have to get coins and 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 randomly get cards and stuff. I'm familiar with them, but I don't play them. Yeah. Okay, so those are called gotcha games because those, mm -hmm. um, you know, those uh, things are called gotcha. And Evolution Girls is basically what if society and evolution itself became a gotcha game? Oh wow! <laughs> and oh, the Jesus. poor character basically has to roll point, uh, collect points, and then roll for evolutionary body parts and evolve herself and <laughs> fight other girls, and it's it's incredible. Uh, and then the final story is actually. I mean, it's about Seiyu, who are somehow mm -hmm. superhuman spaceship pilots, uh, and it it's based off of the physical theory of what if the ether theory is actually was actually true, and mm -hmm. you know, the th like where there is actually a singular plane of reference in the universe, and relativity isn't true, um, and it includes an absolutely amazing scene that is basically a what if gravity suddenly disappeared in the vicinity of the Earth. <laughs> And how the Earth okay. would basically explode, yes. and just lovingly and extremely accurately detailed <laughs> descriptions of what happens. Okay. Anyway, as a physicist, I, I had to I had to license this thing. So uh, we have right. books like that. We have um, an autobiography of Marie Okada, which is mm -hmm. the screenplay, and she she's been in the she's made a number of movies like Machia that's in uh, theaters or was in theaters just earlier, um, and mm -hmm. her story about how she actually grew up in a far out realm, like I mean, almost two hours away from Tokyo in the middle of nowhere and was a truant for an entire mm -hmm. middle school and, and, and elementary school. She basically didn't go to school and it's her story. It's a real story about how she turned that into uh, becoming an anime screenwriter and sort of learning to respect herself. It's a really amazing story uh, that we translated and I'm very proud of that. And then there's other books like uh, we, we recently published one which is kind of combines literature and isekai called JK Haru is a sex worker in another world, which you'd think from oh. that title, it, like, am I publishing just porn? <laughs> yeah. That, one does but, wonder when one hears that. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I mean, and the fact, and the simple answer is, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of sex in it, but, um, mm -hmm. it is not porn. It is a really, really good book about sort of, it takes all the tropes that you, and all our other books about isekai stories, you know, you're reincarnated, you get all these powers, everything is great. Maybe there's some battles, but you always come out ahead. Right. Whereas mm -hmm. in this book, She's reincarnated after getting hit by a truck and is told that this world is so misogynist that women can't even go outside by themselves. So she has one choice. She can be a slave or can she can be a sex worker. So take your pick. And right. it's just, you know, a, a, it's her incredible heart and struggle uh, to just survive in the world. And it's uh, it's hard to read, but then, well, mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil it, but let's just say that it has some of the best catharsis in it that I've ever read mm -hmm. in a light novel. Uh, so it's a, mm -hmm. it's a great book that, like, those kinds of books can definitely appeal to all kinds of different readers out there if we can get the word out. I think Last and First Idol uh, it would actually be a contender for the Hugo if I could get the right people to read it. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas uh, J.K. Haru, I think, could actually be considered a decent entry into uh, feminist literature. Like, I don't know right. if, I mean, it, that's an interesting category to even claim exists, right? But uh, mm -hmm. I know that basically, every, I mean, I think my staff that worked on it and everyone I know that's read it uh, has sort of come away with it as a real uh, powerful story uh, for women. So um, right. that's cool. And I think also we have other stories which 
will appeal to just like kids and just people who want to have fun. You don't have to like anime and manga to to enjoy them because they're fun, right? Like that mm-hmm. um an archdemon's dilemma how to love your elf bride, right? You could totally read that as just a a, a fan of light fantasy, right? Mm-hmm. As it's it, it, sure it has some anime tropes in it, but it's it's a nice fantasy story uh with a what's really just like a, a hilariously cute romance is what it is. So, uh, I think our books can appeal to a wide audience, uh, although the core audience is obviously the same kind of people who enjoy anime and manga. Right. Mm-hmm. No, definitely, definitely. Now, here's a question. So, when you're doing the English titles for these things, do you have, like, disagreements with the publishers about exactly what the English titles should be on some of these things? Well, funny you should bring that up. No. Um, <laughs> so, uh, one, of our, one of our books, tit- one of our books uh, that we published that just had an anime that aired uh, is called How Not to Summon a Demon Lord, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you, were, you watched it when it was airing. Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. And uh, and so we published the original books for that, and uh, I would like to take credit as being uh, the main person who actually came up with that English title. <laughs> oh. um, actually, it was a cooperative with Seven Seas who publishes the manga, but uh, but basically, How Not to Summon, Summon a Demon Lord is something I came up with, and then we, we presented it to the Japanese publisher, and they really liked it, because the original Japanese uh, title for that series is Isekai Maoto Shokan Shoujo no Dore Majitsu. Which uh, literally translates to the the demon lord from another world and the slave magic of the two summoning girls. Okay. Yeah, it really, really rolls mm. off the tongue there. Yeah, yeah, not, not that catchy, no. <laughs> yeah, and of course the slave magic part is something that, uh, I, you know, honestly speaking, uh, when you have slave in the your title of your fantasy story like yeah. it, the the second people see that on the cover they think oh i know what kind of book that is and it, it it's sort of a it, it makes people get the wrong impression although in this case maybe it's mm-hmm. not that wrong but <laughs> but you know well, you saw the anime yeah. right i mean the, the, I've seen the, the, anime, whole, yeah, the, yeah. the whole slave collar thing is just a joke i mean nobody mm-hmm. like the, the it's a it's a trope thing it's not a a sexual fetish thing so Right. In any case, uh, we decided to just totally retitle it to, into something that was humorous and short and easy to remember, and it mm-hmm. worked, you know. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes we do that, and sometimes we just sort of stick as close to the title as we can uh, because that's what works. Um, and sometimes we just try and try and make something that sounds okay in English, you know. That's uh, that's also very difficult. There are other cases where there's an existing fan translation, or people are fans of the series and have come up with their own you know, nickname or name, mm-hmm. or they just use the Japanese name. And it's so popular that for uh, search engine optimization purposes, we keep the Japanese in the title. Uh, right. An example of that is Ari Furita, right? So right. we titled that the English title for that is Ari Furita from world's uh, from, <clears throat> from commonplace to world's strongest is our full title. And the original Japanese uh, uh, title is uh, Ari Furita Shoku Kara Sekai Saikyo. And that the Ari Furita part is just, that means commonplace basically. So right. <laughs> our English title really doesn't make any sense if you like if you think about it too hard, but we wanted to keep Ari Furita in the title as is because otherwise people wouldn't be able to find it if they Googled it, you know, it's the things right. like that. So uh yeah. title choice is an art and not a science. Uh mm-hmm. so it's just something you have to work at. And sometimes there aren't really any great uh great solutions to it, unfortunately. Yeah, because a lot of light novels seem to have these really long titles that just sound odd in English. Mm -hmm. yeah and i try and i try and do my best with those i think one of the longest ones we ended up with is me a genius i've been i was reincarnated into another world but i think they've got the wrong idea that was that was that was what i that was what i decided to go for and that's a literal translation pretty much of the japanese uh but i but i specifically actually made the me a genius part in the front short Mm -hmm. Because the my philosophy on titles is that you can have a super long title and it can be funny and everything, right? But you want like a short something that people can latch onto in their memory, exactly. or they just forget the whole thing. Mm-hmm. That's another mm-hmm. reason why an archdemon's dilemma, case in point, is an archdemon's dilemma semicolon how to love your elf bride, right? right yeah. The the original mm-hmm. the original Japanese title, a literal translation, would be like. I, a demon lord, have obtained an elf bride, but how shall I love her? Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like this rhetorical question. So mm-hmm. uh, we switched it to a third person, and we made it the short in the front. I mean, the meaning is essentially the same, right? So yeah. uh, you just have to be flexible on that kind of thing, and it's it's an interesting art. 
I bet it is, especially when you've got to do titles like, apparently it's my fault that my husband has the head of a beast. Yeah, I struggled over that one really <laughs> hard. Like, it, it, it was actually kind of, I, I, I don't know how, uh, maybe I can, maybe I shouldn't say this publicly, um, but I, uh, my, my, my best idea originally was like, uh, I gave my husband beast head, but I was, I was rejected. <laughs> Well, that's a whole why. other kind of story. <laughs> <laughs> Same meaning. Uh, <laughs> no, but I came up with that one we're currently using. Uh, apparently, it's my fault that I gave my husband the head of a beast. And like at first, I thought, like, oh, this is so clunky. But then I it grew on me. <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe I felt like, yeah, it's clunky, but like it kind of has this attitude to it that I like. I don't know. Well, I, I like how, because I'm looking at the cover right now, and how you emphasized, just to show your point earlier, that the head of a beast is the thing that's actually in big, bold print, and the apparently it's my fault, it's much smaller above it. So if you're just glancing at the cover and a small, like, uh, thumbnail version, you just see the head of a beast and yeah, the and, characters. And all of our books actually have, uh, like, short titles, like an mm. abbreviation, uh, and that one we call Beast Head. Right, uh, uh, which is not because of that joke I made. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> but then there's another one that we licensed at the same time, also uh, that just got an anime announced called "My Next Life as a Villainous." Mm-hmm. Uh, I was reincarnated into. Um, sorry, sorry, um, how was it? No, wait, wait, that's not the title. All of a sudden, I reincarnated. My, my next into... life as a villainous. All all routes lead oh. to doom. Oh, that's right. That's that's just mm-hmm. how we did. It. Yeah. My next life is a villainous. All routes lead to doom, right? Is how we did the mm-hmm. English title. And uh, but the official abbreviation or semi-official is Bacarina, and that's because uh, the fan community that has already really lo- fell in love with this particular story uh, decided to nickname it Bacarina like early, early on. And the mm-hmm. funny thing is that that's not even what the Japanese call it. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, oh. So let me explain Bacarina. And this is something that like most people you wouldn't understand unless you read it. Right. But the main character's mm-hmm. name is Katarina. And mm-hmm. in Japanese, Baka means idiot. So right. everybody. So at some person made a comment, I think, on the Internet and it just stuck. And it was like, oh, she's such a Bacarina instead of Katarina. <laughs> and then everybody just called it Bacarina ever since. So, you know, although it's unofficial, uh, mm-hmm. that's our quote official unofficial abbreviation for the series uh on the other hand we can't stick that on the title because it really truly is something that american fans just invented on their own but right yeah. <laughs> uh but hopefully you know the unofficial title was talk that ha- it's hashtag bacarina let's put it that way right okay mm-hmm. hashtag but okay, well, it's a good split the difference social media yeah it'll work that's the weird thing i noticed about the light novel because i remember uh back in say the 60s or the 70s uh, the Japanese who do a comic or like a, an animated series that would have these weird convoluted long names that was, they'd, they'd have like kind of the, the proper name uh, that people would use, and, but there'd be all kinds of extra bits that people wouldn't because it would make the name huge. And then they kind of stopped doing that. And then the light novels started picking up the last few years and they seem to have readopted that tradition of these big giant titles for things. Is there a reason for that that you know of? Or? Um, I'm not sure you can ascribe it to some kind of, uh, you know, global macroscopic societal change. Um, mm-hmm. I think <laughs> it's something more basic in that um, the long titles, light novel long title phenomena basically took off around um, uh, the release of Oreimo. Uh, which mm-hmm. if, if that's the abbreviation for uh, my, I can't believe my little sister is this cute. Mm-hmm. And it had an anime and had quite a controversial yeah. one and etc. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge hit light novel about 10 years ago, I think now. Um, and that was sort of that, that was the beginning of, Oh, if we make the title longer, people will like be more likely to buy it. And then it mm-hmm. kind of spiraled after that. And now the whole light, no- long lo- light novels with super long titles is like its own trope and meme. So people do it <laughs> for, for, for fun. And in some mm-hmm. ways, actually the theory is and I don't know whether this is actually correct or not, but since so many of these t- light novels with super long light titles uh, started off as web novels, right? Mm-hmm. So they don't have a web novels don't have cover art, right? They're just listing of title names on a screen, and the longer it is, and the more it describes about what the story is, the more information you give the prospective reader. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> you put just a couple words, you know, like the darkness. Right. And it's like, well, what's that about? I don't care. Next. 
<laughs> Whereas on a web novel, it's like, you know, you say, I reincarnated into a villainous, and now all the routes that I'm possibly going to choose are leading to my doom. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that tells you sort of what the story is about, just glancing at the title. Uh, exactly. And I think that helps people just sort of pick it, right? And the longer it is, the more information you can give, and the sillier you can make it seem. And uh, at some point, of course, there's a there's a limit. So I think there's been a bit of a backlash now, but, uh, you know, all things have a happy medium in the end. As for relating it to how the titles in Japan used to be way, way back in the day, um, I don't know. I think there is some... I think there is some historical acceptance of really long episode titles. Like, I don't know about mm -hmm. the series title exactly, but if you, say, watch old episodes of Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and you look at the episode titles, right, and, like, the episode title itself is, like, a summary of everything that happens in the episode, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think, it's a, I think it's actually the same, I think it's actually the same tolerance for super long titles goes back, uh, you know, er, really, really early days. Uh, and I don't know, yeah. that's a good uh, sort of historical research project to see whether, maybe it goes back to Kabuki, you know? Maybe there's, mm -hmm. like, when people were making the woodblock, woodblock, woodblock prints for advertisements of the latest Kabuki show, they're like, well, you might as well just put the whole damn plot of the thing in there. You know, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> right so um uh, i think that's an interesting question but for our perspective the whole long title thing uh we do try and shorten them a little bit like like mm -hmm. for example how not to seem with summon a demon lord is definitely much shorter than the original uh mm -hmm. and even my reincarnated as villainous all, all routes lead to doom is shorter than the original uh i think a mm -hmm. fully literal translation uh, would be I reincarnated as the villainous character in an Otome game, and but all uh, that only and that character only has destruction flags. What shall I do? <laughs> That's like the like a super literal translation of the full yeah, title. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I decided that just throwing in the word doom makes it funny. So I decided to do that. Yes. Yeah. Now is that is that I think um, is that part of the problem with with translating? Because I know. Japanese, the way you essentially shape your verb and which pronouns you use dictates a lot of intent in what you're saying, and we just don't have that in English. Is that is that a problem translating that you'll get something that in Japanese it's an informative sentence, it, it makes perfect sense, but if you present it in English, it ends up being kind of like a history lesson? I think what you're getting at is that Japanese is one of the languages that has the most that is unsaid, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also one of the reasons why machine translation from or to Japanese is, is so much farther behind uh, Western languages, I think, at this point. Yeah. Um, uh, thankfully, at least my translators aren't out of a job just yet. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, every it's all about context. It's all about subtext. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the advantages of the medium that we're translating in, though, is that it is possible to expand things out, right? So mm -hmm. uh, if a person in the original Japanese, uh, you know, is just uh, is just soka right <laughs> or something mm -hmm. which is maybe literally i see right, right. Uh, but mm -hmm. you know reading between the lines we can be like i see you know she said with a sigh i mean you can you can add little stuff like that right that that add, mm -hmm. that actually do describe the nuances that are in the japanese that you don't have in just a pure literal translation you can do it in in prose uh mm -hmm. on the other hand in anime or manga maybe you don't have the luxury of that because you can't like throw in narration right <laughs> yeah. so uh actually it's it's a it's a challenge but it's also an opportunity for our translators to be more creative than they can be in other medium okay no when when you're doing translations um do a lot of the companies do they get really concerned about the the content or do a lot of them just kind of figure they'll just let you do your biz and they kind of leave you alone i mean frankly speaking none of the companies have any have anybody who would be able to properly evaluate our translations uh from mm -hmm. a quality perspective there we definitely send over things like uh you know character name spellings and glossaries and towns and try and get those just officially approved although uh it's very, very rare that they will ever actually come back with corrections on things. Occasionally, mm -hmm. there will be names that have certain, you know, origins that we're like, hey, we think these are based off the thirteen, you know, uh, sins of uh, the thirteen sins of Solomon or something. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. in Latin text, is this what you're going for? And then we got the word back, oh, 
you know what? They are pretty similar to that. That's good. I think we'll use that for volume two. And <laughs> they're like, oh, okay. Uh, right, all right. Then. Um, but there are other cases where it's just obvious, you know, that the names are based off the colors, uh, the, the colors of the rainbow in Arabic. Like one of our books mm-hmm. actually had the names based off that. So um, I'd say that generally in terms of the Japanese side checking our translation, uh, we try and be as transparent as possible about what we're doing. Uh, but it's really up to them to to actually come and uh, and do the work and to to read our stuff and to see whether you know there's anything that they like changed and up until now pretty much no one does that they don't have the time or the resources to handle that we they they trust us okay a uh, quick question do you actually interact with the authors at all do they are they interested in the english translations um for the most part the uh, Japanese authors and I do not interact directly, and that's by design. Uh, the authors have contracts with the publishers, and we have contracts with the publishers. Uh, we are not directly licensing the works from the authors themselves, and therefore, in standard Japanese business, you know, uh, business lingo, there is the correct quote "madoguchi" or window. Um, mm-hmm. And if we go and talk directly to an author, the publisher gets mad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, and the same thing the other direction. If an author goes and starts talking directly with us, they're going to get mad at the author too. And the editor basically, if we want to ask a question to the author, we can, but we have to pass it through the through. publisher. Everything has to mm. go through. So you've never actually met any of these authors or anything then? That is not true because I am an annoying uh, foreigner and I ask her things that I shouldn't. So, uh, for example, I have um, uh, one of the authors we actually brought as a guest to Anime Expo last summer, uh, the author of Grimgard Fantasy and Ash. So, of course, I met him because he was uh, I chaperoning around. But together with him also came his editor and a representative from their licensing department. So it's not like we were ever alone in a room together. Right. right. Uh, so, uh, you know, a meeting with the authors is fine as long as the publisher is also in the room. So okay. I have actually met with, uh, uh, one other author, the author of Realist Hero. Um, mm-hmm. and we had a nice dinner, uh, and I actually didn't just meet him. I also brought the translator of the books, and so the translator and the author met and uh, had a lovely chat about old school RPGs, and it was really nice. Um, so I like to think that might be the first time, uh, maybe that uh, mm-hmm. a light novel author and his translator have met in person uh, officially. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Huh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering about that. Don, did you have something you want to ask? Sorry, I thought I interrupted you. Oh no, that was kind of that was kind of uh, ties into what I was wondering too. Because I know there's a lot of companies in in especially North America that, for marketing reasons, they'll have very specific ways that they want every aspect of the character or the setting or the story represented. And I was just wondering if if that was something with like the uh, the light novels, if if the 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 original publishers and copyright holders got wrapped around the axle over a lot of stuff or not um basically it depends on the company uh smaller companies like hobby japan or overlap they don't have the manpower to sort of uh to treat every single uh book mm-hmm. that they publish in in that in such a, a major way uh but mm-hmm. other companies definitely do uh do a lot of careful checking of things so uh if we for example we are you know we want to create some kind of advertisement or a banner or even the cover design for example all of that has to go through them and be approved mm-hmm. right so graphic design stuff uh, definitely goes through approval pr- approvals process. The translation itself, like I said, they don't really have the resources to check it properly. So those are a little bit less um, uh, le- less um, strict about that, I guess you could say. But although I think if they did have the resources, they would definitely want to. Huh, okay. Now, do you find that a lot of these companies, are they excited about having their stuff translated and going to new markets or is it just kind of like a little side thing for them do you think well the south asia and chinese and taiwanese markets for life novels as well korean have been mature for quite a while so Mm -hmm. most of these companies do have significant experience in selling their books uh, to other asian countries Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's not like the completely brand new thing about selling overseas Uh, however in the english market it has been very limited for a while and for many of them i think it was quite a pleasant surprise how well things have uh, blown up in the English market. Uh, I know, I mean, it, it's hard for me to get a perspective on exactly how much, you know, like effect it's had, 
but mm-hmm. I know at least one publisher, for example, um, uh, the person I was doing the negotiations with uh, got a new assistant who is now my basically uh, the person who I talk with completely. And mm-hmm. I think that entire new hire basically was thanks to our business with them. So, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm helping to employ people in the industry pretty directly is an interesting, uh, interesting aspect. I think also that they've been producing a lot more anime versions of their books. And although yeah. that was always their plan, I think the fact that we are able to publish them, uh, we had a really great success with In Another World with my smartphone. And uh, even though the anime itself was like, you know, not a huge hit in the West or anything, uh, it really increased the sales of the books. And, and now we're selling, you know, a really decent number and we're putting them out in print. They're one of our first uh, print launches. So uh, they're kind of, you know, other companies look at that success and go, hey, you know, if we can get these guys to put out the books first and then make an anime, then it'll be like in Japan where we can increase the sales of the original books and we can make money from that like more directly than just streaming mm-hmm. an anime, right? Or DVDs or Blu-ray sales, which take, you know, mm-hmm. so much longer to put out there. So by being able to publish the original books in English and do it quickly is also a super important aspect to it mm-hmm. and put them out quickly so that like it's much more akin to how they're sold in the Japanese market and they can do better predictions and they can have more freedom about what projects they want to actually uh, make anime in, into. It's it's an actually really good thing for the companies and, and they do understand that. I can see that. Um, so you mentioned sales. So let's let's t- pivot a tiny bit here. So how, what do, I, I don't want actual sales numbers, of course, that's not, you know, that's not my business, but, um, but in terms of like your sales, uh, peaks and drop offs and that. So is it expected that the, you know, the first book sells a ton and then they just kind of, you know, it's a long tail from there. This just quickly goes down or how does that usually work? Well, uh, we only really have data at this point from from digital ebooks, and I'm not yeah, sure yeah, whether course. print will be similar or not. I think print might be a little bit more um, drastic drop off, but mm-hmm. we find that ebooks, uh, it's really the drop off is is not as severe as um, <clears throat> as it could have been. Uh, for example, I would say the volume one uh, mm-hmm. does sell about sixty mm, percent more than volume two. Say, but it's not twice as much. It's maybe only about sixty percent as much. And then over and as it, it drops off. Uh, more and more, but I mean, it drops off, you know, by about that same percentage, maybe through volume four. And then after volume four, it's steady as a rock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, over time, books continue to sell. So it's not like it sells a thousand copies and then stops. It's just they, they sell one or two books a day uh, consistently for as long as we sell them, basically. And there's a slow decay. There's a slow global decay over about uh, two years. Uh, that I've mm-hmm. been able to model at this point because we have about two years worth of data. So uh, I've been doing proper modeling of sales behaviors, and uh, right. it's it's actually a decent. Uh, it's a very long tail. Let's put it that way. Like series that mm-hmm. don't sell very well in the beginning drop off more quickly, but the ones that do sell well and that we continue to put out new volumes of every you know three months or two months, uh, those just continue to sell. And so. It's it's good, and I think the fact that the the really ease of uh, e-readers and you know hey buy the next volume it's just right there right mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. that really helps actually I think keep people uh, buying the series to the end when it's a physical book and you have to sort of go back to the bookstore or yeah. even just or even just sort of like you know if you're at the bookstore and they have volumes two three and seven right mm-hmm. you know it's yeah. one of those you know it's one of those things where it's just it's hard to get people to buy the whole series whereas if it's digital it's so easy right and so i mm-hmm. think actually digital has a much uh, better drop off behavior uh, than physical will but we will find out shortly um cuz i notice a lot of like say the light novels and that they just have like some of them have huge numbers of like volumes do you find that that kind of puts people off or do people get excited about digging into something that's got some like meat and substance to it? I think that both your points are valid. Um, Hmm. There's a, there's a balance there. I think that a light novel series between, you know, about like eight to 10 novels long seems to be the sweet point, the sweet spot for people who are, want to cut into like a nice book and, you know, with a big story, but more than, you know, 15 or 16 volumes. And if it's, they're all out there at the same time, I think it does actually give some people some pause. Uh, Mm -hmm. So 
but it depends, right? I mean, the long, mm-hmm. super long series are really hard to keep in bookstores. So, uh, same thing is happen. Same thing is true for manga. Like, you know, people want to get into One Piece, for example. There's a mm-hmm. reason they're putting those out in omnibus editions, yeah. right? It's just that there are so many volumes, and if you cut that down by a factor of three, it just it just is easier for people mentally to say, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm just buying four books. But no, they're actually buying 12, right? But, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's the kind of thing. And actually, we might even – we haven't announced anything, but uh, we might even be doing some of our series as omnibus editions and not just single volumes in print. Uh, mm-hmm. And then that makes things a little bit easier for the bookstores and also for the people buying them. And it does save a little money too because we, you know, we're not going to price them three times the individual volumes, right? Right. So, uh, uh, it'll be, it'll be a little bit more uh, cost effective for people as well. So, uh, I think that your valid point, we have one series that's like 31 volumes long called invaders of the Rokujoma, and it's still ongoing. Uh, wow. and we've actually published through volume 17 and also streamed volumes 22 through 20 through 30. Um, and, uh, that there, there's an interesting backstory from that, but I, I don't think I'll get into that, but we'll, we'll have the whole mm-hmm. series ready, uh, pretty soon. And actually that series is available to read on our site. One volumes one through 21 will be available completely for free. So you don't even oh. need an account. If you want to get into a light novel and just check it out totally for free, come to jnovel.club and, uh, check out invaders of the Rokujoma. You can read like, like literally, uh, 17 volumes worth it right now, completely for free. It's a great, heartwarming uh, science fiction fantasy harem story <laughs> that combines all <laughs> kinds of genres. It's got ghosts, it's got ghost hunters, it's got sentai warriors, it's got robots, it's got spaceships, it's got time travel, it's got all kinds of stuff. <laughs> wow. And cute girls. <laughs> and and cute. Now, <laughs> now, there's something that I wanted to ask about. So the a lot of these do have like the whole harem thing going on, which I understand is, you know, is appealing to the male audience and everything like that. But do you think that that's actually one of the things that's actually keeping your female audience down? That a lot of this stuff is very, not just male oriented, but yeah, it's mostly about a guy and this huge collection of um, cuties that surround him. Yeah. I mean, definitely a lot of our stories have that aspect to them and there's a, there's a significant uh, downside to female audiences reading that. A lot of our stories, however, don't. Um, like, mm-hmm. I'd say that, you know, we do publish a lot of fantasy. That's definitely the most popular genre. But the actual mm-hmm. specifically harem fantasy, where it's one guy and tons of girls, um, uh, is not – we don't actually – published that many of those uh there's some that have that quote aspect to them but most of them usually if there's romance in it or there's relationships it's just a single guy and a single girl actually and the other mm-hmm. girls are sort of hanger-ons <laughs> in a way uh mm-hmm. so if you look through our catalog there isn't that much pure uh harem in it uh Rokujoma, actually though to go back to that one although mm-hmm. it is definitely a guy surrounded by tons of girls it is the most sweet sweetest and like like um heartfelt thing ever mm-hmm. it's almost more like his family than his his you right. know waifus so right. uh I, that one actually has a very strong female following too uh mm-hmm. just because of the nature of the story it's all about love and family and the loss and, and nice stuff like that um whereas other stories that are much more just pure harem uh are about the cute girls <laughs> So we, we we cater all types. On the other hand, actually, on the back, if you f- flip that in reverse, um, uh, uh, my, my reincarnated as villainous, my all routes lead to doom, is actually mm-hmm. a, a what's called a reverse harem. So. Right. Uh, reverse harem, of course, is when it's a single girl who's surrounded by guys who want to mm-hmm. <laughs> want to screw. Her. Although in in, in Baccarina's case, it's not just guys; it's like literally everyone. And the thing that's hilarious about it is that the main character is so idiotic. She like. She she is so dumb about these sorts of things that just everybody falls for her completely head of her heels and she just does not get it. <laughs> Whether <laughs> girls, women, the girls, guys, dogs, it doesn't matter. Everybody loves Baccarina <laughs> and uh, and she just she can't handle it. So so that's another case actually where it appeals to both sexes because it's just hilarious, right? right? Um, uh, but actually, I have found in some of the surveys that uh, if we were to do like a true reverse harem, which is like you know you could all uh, like a Otome game kind of one girl mm-hmm. with with a bunch of male quarter, uh, suitors, um, uh, that actually would turn off our male audience. Uh, yeah. So I'm sure the mm-hmm. opposite is true. Uh, to, yeah, I'm sure the opposite is true as well. But we don't really have that many of those that are just pure like that. I right. think I try and license stories that are based off more than just a bunch of cute girls. 
Mm. Oh well, yeah. I, I, would, I, I can see that in your catalog. <laughs> you definitely have a have a wide breadth. Just in general, light novels have this reputation for better or for worse of, mo- of being. You know, there's a lot of harems in light novels, just pure, not just yours. Yeah, I think that that uh, that's definitely something that the Japanese audience uh, eats up. Uh, maybe a little bit more than the Western audience. Even the guy, even the guys like there's a segment that love their harem uh, uh, anime and love their harem manga and and light novels. But I don't think it's as um, high a percentage of the overall audience as it is in Japan. Right. Right. Yeah. Well. I, I think, yeah, I think you're right, but I think when you talk about, like, the, the Japanese harem stories, there should probably be another term, because in the Western mind, you call it a harem, it's instantly salacious and sexual, and there's a lot of those stories that aren't, they're 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 more coy than anything else, because as I've mentioned uh, here in the West, that's been a, a, a story we've done a lot, because Archie, like, the Archie and Jughead Archie, that's a harem comic. It's Archie Andrews, and for some reason, every woman in town is absolutely in love with him and determined to go out with him in that. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially... And even the idea of the, uh, the reverse harem comics, that was kind of a running trope if you went to, like, comic books in North America back in, like, say, the 40s or the 50s. No, there's definitely some history to that in the West as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, that actually is an interesting, subtle difference between the Western and Eastern audiences in terms of their what they're they're looking for in their quote harem stories. And I think your point about the difference in the connotation of quote a harem story in the West and the East is very is very true. Uh, I've mm-hmm. definitely seen a lot of people who who read these stories and just get frustrated that there isn't more actual <laughs> uh, sexual encounters in them. And then it's like, oh, you have all these beautiful girls and they just want to screw you. Why don't you do it? And people just, uh, you know, get really angry at the characters. And, the we- and in Japan, on the other hand, if there's any actual sexual activity, then people get super angry when it's not with their girl or, yeah. uh, or you know, or something <laughs> like that. Or, or the, the protagonist is just a self-insert, right? So as soon as mm-hmm. they actually do something, uh, then it's like, no, they can't self insert anymore it, right. it's a it's sort of a difference in uh in what the audience is looking for in their stories uh mm-hmm. and i do feel like actually i even when i introduced uh, jk haru as a sex worker in another world i made the joke that uh, at anime expo i made the joke that everybody kept asking for more snoo snoo in their in their light novels and I was like, well here you go <laughs> like there's right. basically one every page here so <laughs> right <laughs> that was my it was my sort of bitter joke about the audience right but <laughs> I like how you use the term snoo snoo. <laughs> um, actually, well, there's an interesting question. Then, are the do the lead characters in light novels that, based on your experience, usually tend to just be mostly inserts? Like, is that where where, where the focus usually is, and for these light novel leads? Um. Yes and no. Uh, it, not all light novels are like that. There are definitely plenty with a very. Yeah. Uh, with the very well fleshed out main characters and that have real personalities, I'd say mm-hmm. it's less. But the the more the more standard harem the story is, the more likely the main character is like a mm-hmm. pure a pure insert. insert. Like right. uh, I think uh, one of the ones that maybe the like you can sort of see a. a, a a spectrum of it if you look at in another world my smartphone versus mm-hmm. realist hero perhaps mm-hmm. right yeah. both of those main characters are to some extent self inserts but yes. definitely in another world with my smartphone's uh, toya he his personality is basically pretty blank yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let me let's be frank i mean he has yeah. and, he, and every once in a while whenever one of his w- wives is threatened he sort of goes psycho psychopathic but then uh, the rest of the time he's just Whatever, I'll do this. I'll do that, and and he doesn't really have very much of a of a specific personality. Whereas the the character um, in Soma in uh, Realist mm-hmm. Hero, uh, he has like he has a goal and he has desires, and he and you can tell that he uh, he is emotionally invested in everything that he's doing. Uh, but even so, I still feel like he's a he's kind of a blank slate. You don't really know little, too yeah. much about mm-hmm. you don't really know too much about uh, what he's thinking outside of like the initial the current um, uh, the the current crisis of whatever. Right. So you also can sort of self insert in that. On the other hand, there are other stories where the the main character is is really just a, a you know, not a self insert at all exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, or maybe a self-insert for the author. Uh, I think, for example, the main character in Ari Furuta, Hajime, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, 
Hajime is not like a bland personality at all in a way. He's this horrible chunibyo, you know, I'm going to I'm going to uh, mess you up to uh, I don't know I don't know what your what your language rating is on your this podcast. Um but uh you know, he sort of has that super hard edge in the beginning and then sort mellows mm-hmm. out over the edge but then brings it back all the time. And he's definitely not someone where I would be like, "Oh yeah, I could be that guy." It's more like, yeah. you know, I wish I, you know, I, I think what it is is that's the author's self insert because the right. author loves mm. that that kind of crazy overpowered chunibyo. That's an interesting mm. term. I don't know if uh, your audience is familiar with it, but uh, chunibyo literally translates to um, second uh, second grade middle school syndrome, <laughs> <laughs> and and what it means is basically it's like you know that kid in middle school who is like. I am the darkness. You must not approach. <laughs> and or he's like, or he's like, I have powers. I'm, I'm moving you with my mind. You know, he's sort of the guy who, the kid who is like so creepy that like that's his defense mechanism. It's like, right. okay, I don't even want to bully that guy. <laughs> anyway, they, they so just Chun- live in their own little world. Yeah, they live in their own little world, and it's like they they kind of have these own self delusions. Uh, and so uh, the author likes to call himself the world's uh, biggest Chunibyo fan. And oh, in this afterwards, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's basically where he like what he describes his own story as. It's just his own delusions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what part of what makes it so fun to read, actually. But uh, but that's the character that would definitely not be a self insert, even though it's Very a harem, happy. right? Mm-hmm. So I, I think it, it, there's various types. The difference between novels and I think the most common harem anime Mm -hmm. manga thing which is of course visual novels right Right, in a visual Mm -hmm. novel the main character it's often you don't even see their face right you just read their narration Mm -hmm. they're not voiced usually it's only the girls that are voiced and so those stories are are 100 percent self-insert or Mm -hmm. almost right Uh, you know Mm -hmm. there's there obviously there's all varieties but that's most very common for there Uh, but with novels and to some extent manga uh, it's harder to be a pure self-insert without just making it extraordinarily land right right so so i think that's why there's a little less of that but it like i said the farther you go towards the pure harem comedy element of the story Mm -hmm. the more um self-inserty the main character tends to get right right Hmm. now actually i have another odd question this is actually a a style question i've noticed reading some of the light novels that stylistically they're all over the board and and you get some really weird stuff like for example let's take a look at realist hero realist hero will jump from multiple first persons to multiple third persons constantly like stylistically it's all it's it's like all over the place is is that normal for light novels what why is why don't they seem to be able to like stick with one perspective or one approach to writing um let me go into a little bit of light novel history so okay. the initial – the first book that is considered a light novel, although this mm-hmm. is debatable, um, is actually Record of Lotus War. Mm-hmm. And that book actually arose as a teleplay of D&D sessions by mm-hmm. uh, the author, Mizuno, who was the dungeon right. master, and his club at, uh, I think, uh, Keio University. And right. then those were published as articles in Comptique magazine, along with illustrations mm-hmm. of the characters. Then after those mm-hmm. sort of became a hit, uh, Mizuno-sensei was asked to re- write them into a book, basically. Mm-hmm. So imagine a D&D session. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, people are, the dungeon master is telling what's going on, but then each of the people, uh, each of the players are saying what their character is doing and what their character is saying right yeah. and a teleplay is essentially just someone typing down exactly what happens during the yeah. session and then if you turn that into a novel well now you have a light novel so that's why light novels mm. for example have so much dialogue and so much description <laughs> or, or not so much description in some cases well in some cases but uh, the it's often the case especially character looks and and such they're almost like they're it's almost like describing a character sheet in, yeah, in yeah. oftentimes in light novels uh and so that's sort of the origin of the, of the format there and the perspectives issue in terms of whether it's third person or first person it, mm-hmm. in japanese itself doesn't have such a clear so it's such a clear distinction between uh, perspectives in the writing. And, Jap- oh. and Japanese writing can fluidly go between third and first person without actually being horribly uh, hard to understand. That's just, the, mm-hmm. in general, the way writing is in Japanese. And it's especially true in light novels because it constantly goes from essentially the perspective of the characters to the perspective of the, quote, 
dungeon master narrator and mm-hmm. it doesn't really differentiate between the two um now realist hero actually flipping from completely different people's first person perspectives for different sections um mm-hmm. uh, that's not that common for late novels that's kind of a higher technique right. okay. <laughs> usually <laughs> usually late novels what you'll find is like you know entire book will be from a main character's first person perspective and uh, and but for the most part but there might be some sections that are more third person-y and that's mm-hmm. kind of one of the difficulties of translating them but then oftentimes in volume three or four by the time you get up there the author mm-hmm. will like to mix it up and switch the perspective to one of those other characters all of a sudden and mm-hmm. uh, you know for a large section of book four it'll be from the perspective of the you know the companion character and you'll sort of see while they see things um, so it's not uncommon to actually have the books because they're such long series right to have sections with different perspectives of different characters. Realist Hero kind of takes that up a notch and has oh, okay. just you know, lots of individual sections. Uh, but there's actually other series that go even worse beyond that. Uh, Me, a Genius, if you remember that one, mm-hmm. Me, a Genius. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, that one literally uh, has the same scene multiple times from every single character's different pr- perspective. And uh, and the reason is because the humor of that series, it's a comedy series, is entirely because everybody is, sees things in different ways. Like mm-hmm. one character, the main character, the, the main character basically is reincarnated into a slightly alternate version of the normal Earth, um, but his mother is this super genius or this scientist and. And somehow when he was a little kid, uh, his mother saw like some scribblings he made on the wall and came up with a brand new quantum theory that revolutionized the world. And basically the, the main character is treated as like the super genius of the of the entire planet for some reason, right? Mm-hmm. And he's just like, I just remember some things about my old life in Japan. I'm not that much of a genius. And, and uh, meanwhile, everybody else seems to think that he has the solutions to the universe. And so you see everybody's different perspectives as you see right. like completely different ways. Uh, of, of seeing things and that's where the humor comes from so uh, mm. there is a variety of, of methods and styles for, for light novels to write and uh, mixing of third person and first person is not uncommon uh, mm. I would say that Realist Hero flipping around between different people's first person is a little bit um, less common than you often right. have it's usually just um, mostly third person or a what I like to think of as pretty much a third a first person e third person so it's a right, third right. person narration but it's there's it's all from a basically one person's perspective right, and yeah. in that case what we'll do is we will take the lines that are sort of obviously in first person in the japanese and we might mm-hmm. italicize them and turn them into monologue and right. then the rest of it will leave in third person we do that in the infinite dendrogram for example and stuff like that hmm. Hmm. So so stylistically translating can be a bit of a challenge sometimes then. Oh, it's extremely of it. That's one of the most uh, difficult parts of translated light novels is coming up with the right tensing and the Mm -hmm. right uh, way of describing to the reader whose perspective the line is from. That can be very, very difficult. Especially since they don't seem to use dialogue tags. They just seem to like just go back and forth. It's the characters and you kind of have to guess which character is speaking based on what they're saying. Well, we actually add a lot of dialogue tags, actually. Um, I think Realist Hero adds most of them, for that matter. The reason why that is the case is because in the original Japanese, um, characters uh, will speak in different levels of politeness, or they will use different terms to address other characters, which are unique. Uh, For example, uh, let's say... Um, uh, the main character of Realist Hero is named Soma, right? Mm-hmm. But yes. one of his, you know, one of his uh, wives might say uh, Soma San. You use right. that honorific, and another one might use Soma just without an honorific. Another yeah. one might mean, you know, Dan Nasama, which means like right. my husband, or mm-hmm. or or just like Oji or King. You know, everybody right. could yeah. address him in a different way, and so you can know who is saying the line just from what word they use, right? right. Or what politeness level. And so in the Japanese, it's obvious to the reader who's saying what, but in English, it's not necessarily. So we have to use a combination of techniques. Uh, there's voicing the characters in a unique enough way where it's sort of obvious mm-hmm. who's speaking, but that can get annoying depending on the mm-hmm. method of, of usage of that. There's actually, in, in Another World with My Smartphone, there's literally 40 different characters, and they all speak in unique, silly ways. Uh, and mm-hmm. so the translator has started sort of, I think he's gone a little bit too far, honestly. Because he's like, oh, this character is going to speak like a like a stereotypical Italian. <laughs> Like oh, okay. nice at the media, and it's like oh god, <laughs> but it's just a, it's a throwaway character. It's all right, you know. But 
<laughs> but you know, there's but but because the original Japanese, I think, uh, had some kind of really silly extra thing that they added at the end of the sentences every time. So, yeah. uh, like almost like a like a magical girl mascot. So, um, mm-hmm. uh, that that is a big challenge in light novels. But we can get away with it by either just adding speaker tags, like right. you know, said. Sarah or whatever, uh, yeah. or we can get away with with voicing, uh, or we can do other even more subtle things in terms of um, like having the lines and then having a description of the character that said the lines after the lines in the same order, so that you can work out who was doing what right. if you if you read carefully. So those are all hmm. methods that we use. Hmm. Now another uh, odd bit, getting kind of uh, dancing around. What Rob was talking about. Do you find there's a really strong delineation between, I'd say, professional writers and talented amateurs with the light novels? Or is that kind of a more of a mix? Or There are very few professional light novel writers. And, and I mean, mm. and by professional here, I mean people who make their living just writing light novels. I'm not even sure how many it is, but it's probably less than like 30 or 40. <laughs> wow. Like wow. the vast majority of people who are publishing late novels have other jobs and mm-hmm. they don't do it full time because it doesn't make enough money to that for them. And there isn't like the sales aren't there. The ones mm-hmm. that are big hits like Sword Out Online or other people, those those people obviously um, are full time. Uh, but uh, even, you know, the guy who wrote Record of Lotus War, Mizuno Sensei, he, you know, he made some amount of money. It was a hit, but he then went on to write scenarios for games. And he's a writer. He's a professional writer, yes. But mm-hmm. he doesn't just write light novels at all. And I think a lot of the ones that, uh, even like the writer of Full Metal Panic and, you know, classic light novel series like that, he writes, you know, game scenarios and, and project proposals and all kinds of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think if you want to be a professional light novel writer in Japan, you're going at it the wrong way. You want to be a (laughs) professional writer and then you can make a living. Uh, It's just, uh, there are a couple people, however, that are, there are very, very few. One is the example is the author of Grim Garden Fantasy and Ash. And Mm -hmm. he, and when I brought him as a guest to Anime Expo, people asked him this question or or something similar to this at a panel. And uh, his answer was basically, he's written like, 85 novels since he started in his career and most of them don't sell very well but though if you want to make enough money to live you have to write like four books a year mm-hmm. <laughs> and right. so yeah. uh yeah the people who are truly the full-time light novel authors are extremely prolific and just write and write and write and write and they're constantly writing mm-hmm. and half their well you know 80 percent of their series don't end up getting anywhere but maybe one of them gets an anime made yep. they get some money from that you know they're kind of mm-hmm. lucky so um but the total number of them in the industry you can almost count on on your hands Wow. wow, so it must pay really poorly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they get royalties from the sales, right? But mm-hmm. the fact is, is that if you look at the total sales figures of, you know, even the top selling ones in Japan, they're selling, you know, 10, 15,000 copies, you know? Right. And you can do the math on that. I mean. Yeah, yeah. That's right. If anyone wants to see the actual sales figures, there's the, um, uh, there's a light novel uh, review channel on YouTube. Uh, done by Justice R. Stone, who also does the Light Novel podcast. And um, he actually has sales figures almost every week or every two weeks about in Japan, at, you know, how, what, what's selling and how many. And yeah, the, the top ones that the most sometimes will get up to like 60 or 70,000, but that's pretty rare. And that's like a really major, that's like so, the newer volume of Sword Art Online or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so yeah, of course, the that author Kawahara is doing pretty well, right? Yeah. But yeah. then everybody else, pretty much, like uh, you know, they're 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 scraping by. It's it's not like manga ka make a ton of money either, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's a labor of love for these people. And the light novel authors, uh, I think, the ones that are most of them actually that we publish, for example, they have other full time jobs actually, mm-hmm. and they do it for love and because they love writing and uh, uh, and it's and it's okay. Uh, it's not, it doesn't pay very great, but, uh, you know, at least it gets us some great content out there. So we're happy yeah. to sort of publish it in English and maybe get them a wider audience, right? The more right, right. money we can bring into the industry, the the more talent we can keep in it. 
Right. Mm. Now, here's something. One of the things that's happening here in North America is, of course, thanks to uh, Kindle and Kindle Direct Publishing, we're getting more and more people that are just doing the self-publishing route and such. Do you think that that's a possible route for that people in Japan will also start doing? They'll just start bypassing the publishers and publishing directly? Because like, there is Kindle Japan. They can actually do it through Kindle in there, too. There have been some publishers that have uh, started attempting that. And there has been some very limited success for them. But the problem is that, uh, well, Kindle itself is, exists in Japan, but it doesn't have nearly the market share because the majority of digital book reading that is done in Japan is actually done on cell phones and tablets through specifically manga, digital manga services, right? Mm -hmm, and right. they're sort of specialized. And so people will subscribe and read manga on these sites. But then when it comes to novels, uh, what people read on their phones and tablets are web novels and specifically right. from sites like Naro. So these authors, instead of like publishing on the line and trying to get money from people, they definitely publish online independently, but they publish for free. And mm. the, and the way, and when they get their, they get their payday as it were, um, if a publisher looks at their web novel, that's popular and goes, Hey, we want to put this out in book form. So mm -hmm. there are other reasons actually for that, which is it have to do with Japanese taxes and royalties and such, but basically right. authors are paid when their books are printed in the lump sum by how many copies are printed and not necessarily by how many are sold. Oh, okay. So that they, 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 you know, every time there's a new printing, the author gets a new check kind of in the mail mm. is the way it works. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I, now that actually, there's some changes to the law, to the tax law that might change that in the future, but uh, that's really getting into the weeds. Um, mm. <laughs> in any case, the authors and self-published authors, um, I mean, I'd say even the most web novel authors are, quote, self-published. It's just right. that there isn't a monetization that is efficient. If you just published your book on Amazon Kindle and you charged, mm -hmm. you know, three bucks for it, you, nobody's going to read it in Japan. Uh, there isn't right. that mm -hmm. culture because there's so much free content that you could read on, on web novels that uh, is competing with it that's essentially the same type of content. And, uh, you know, you, you could try and hire, like, artists and stuff and, you know, make a nice book. There are some authors that have attempted that kind of thing, especially uh, ones that were, had been published by a publisher in the past and have gone mm -hmm. independent, for example. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but I don't know of any real success stories from it. Not yet, anyway. Okay, interesting. Right. Mm. So what do you think is the future of the light novel industry? Like, what do you think is going to happen you, in trend-wise and everything? Well, I think that it's fairly bright, actually. There's a there's a, a large number of new authors constantly coming in and a large number of authors that are constantly dropping out. Uh, mm. But that's not necessarily unhealthy, right? Uh, the number of actual books that are being published every month is continuing to rise. People are, uh, the publishers are creating new labels. And one thing that's interesting is that, uh, I know I mentioned uh, Shosets in uh, Ninaro, which is uh, sort of the biggest web novel site in Japan. So yes, I want to become a novelist. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are other ones like that, but there are actually some uh, that are being started like Kakuyomu, uh, which mm -hmm. is actually owned by Katakawa, which right. is basically yeah. there are sites where people can post the, their works online for free but at the same time they also can post works that aren't free and people can pay to read so uh, uh i think there's going to be a transition to more serialized but paid content right. as mm. people develop the systems uh in the west uh wattpad for example has already started to experiment with this yes. um and uh and i think that um you know i don't know exactly how this is going to affect the you know the standard publishing industry as it were um in many ways sort of what we're doing with our subscription services is, is a prototype for that as well it's not per chapter but it's a subscription service but i think that mm -hmm. um uh, things like kindle unlimited also is a similar uh idea of just you, know, you pay a monthly fee and you can read lots of stuff <laughs> right yeah yeah exactly right yeah, yeah. um and i think that in japan uh, more and more authors are going to experiment with those sorts of services and the ones mm -hmm. that are provide quality content might succeed with them. And then that can still be done under the auspices of a publisher. Like you could do that with a proper editor with uh, mm -hmm. illustrations. And if it's, it becomes a viable, um, you know, uh, financially for them to sell things that way, uh, that might well uh, become like a primary revenue source as opposed to sort of right now, which is more just, advertising for the eventual physical book right, right but it, right. eventually that will sort of flip over as we the web novelists of today become the serialized web you know novelists professional novelists of the future 
So in that sense, you think that a lot of web novelists then are actual professional novelists or so uh, it's almost a transition phase for some of them. They're, they do the web novel, light novel thing, and then eventually they'll write quote unquote real fiction or real books. That's a good question. I mean, I think what uh, I've definitely seen that many of the novels that we published were originally web novels. And right. those authors actually are continuing to publish the web novel even as their the late novel version is being published by the official publisher in print. So mm -hmm. even though they, they were started with web novels and now got a contract with the real publisher, they aren't quitting the web novel scene. They're keeping mm -hmm. up their relationship with their fans that they created while they were doing web novels and uploading content for free, essentially. Right. And they're continuing to do that. And that's a crucial part of marketing, right? So uh, you, I think that is the main difference between how light novels used to work 10, 15 years ago, whereas just you go to the bookstore, you see what looks interesting. And these days, uh, you have to sort of get your content out there for free with a large amount of sample, essentially. So the web novel acts as a as essentially a draw for you as an artist. Now, whether these mm. people will end up you know, like trans, you know, writing works that are not quote unquote light novels and not as tropey or anime or manga, -y, um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of them. I'm not sure that that actually will 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 happen very quickly. Uh, right. There's definitely a maturity to the readers of web novels that's happening. It's they're, they're mm -hmm. the people who grew up with web novels are getting older. So, for example, some of the uh, Kodansha just came out with a brand new line of novels called Legend Novels, uh, which is licensing web novels, same as other novel series, but they're specifically targeting web novels that are aimed at a bit higher audience, a bit older audience. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting phenomenon. We'll see whether they actually do well or not. It's an interesting experiment because they don't have internal pictures. They just have a cover. Uh, but they're trying to sort of appeal to web novels, but ones that are aimed at a slightly older crowd and whether those end up succeeding or not. But the, the authors of those novels, however, didn't necessarily start writing like a super, you know, in another world, by a start phone type stuff and then, you know, write more interesting stuff later. I think it's just like the type of authors that end up succeeding is what mm. is, will change. Like, right. I feel like an author who, who likes to write super light fantasy doesn't really change like what he writes Mm. He, he's not as affected by the audience as you might think. I think uh, it's there's just there's a whole p range of authors who have write all kinds of things all out there, and it, whatever is you know more popular at the time will be what bubbles to the top. Right, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. well, now, from the other side, uh, are a lot of the companies uh, when when they publish somebody's work, is that published more freelance, or are the companies trying to build up stables of these authors? Authors, and this is a complicated question that's actually not nearly as obvious as you might think. One of the super important aspects of the light novel industry that is totally unseen by the West is the editors. Mm -hmm. So the, what's actually more the stable that publishers collect is editors, right? Huh. And the editors are the ones that go out and find the authors and sort of become like their team, right? And mm -hmm. what will happen sometimes is the editors will move to a different publisher and they'll bring their authors with them. Oh. <laughs> right? Uh, authors, however, often work with multiple publishers. Um, so one author will work with uh, one editor from one publisher, but then another editor from another publisher will say, hey, uh, we have a, you know, would you like to, uh, would you like to do something with us? And they'll say, okay, sure. And then they'll have two books published at once, or they'll sort of overlap a little bit. So I'd say all the successful and quote, professional light novel authors have published with multiple publishers. The old, there's, it's very rare that you have someone that just sticks with a single publisher their entire career. Huh. Yeah, that is a little odd because over here they tend to uh, want to get the the, the quote unquote creative type on a, an exclusive contract. I don't. I'm not sure whether exclusive contracts like that would even be legal in Japan because of the way the copyright laws work. Um, right. But uh, more importantly, authors and cre content creators in general in Japan like. The type of contracts that you get in the West, like, for example, the, the old contracts that they used to sign, you know, the Marvel creators used to sign, right, where, like, mm. they own nothing. Those are literally mm. illegal in Japan, right? Mm. The, 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 you cannot sign away your IP rights to the things you create in Japan, not, not completely, not you know, awesome. irrevocably. Um, uh, the Japanese copyright law is actually gives a, a lot of power to the original creator. And, in fact, they can block anything if they truly want to. 
um, okay. which is good and bad in some cases, depending on the creator. But um, <laughs> but in any case, that that sort of and that philosophy in Japanese um, in Japanese media effectively uh, means that the authors view themselves as more independent. I feel than authors in the West, and I don't think even if a, a publisher tried to to sign someone to an exclusivity contract, it would be mm-hmm. short term or or be something just for a particular series. It's very rare, and and I don't know even outside of authors like anime producers and and directors they're constantly moving from studio to studio right the only time people yeah. stick in the same in the same studio or publisher is when they're invested in it right mm-hmm. if you own part of it or you founded it then yeah you're going to stick there but aside from that it's really you know project per pro- by project based and and person to person you know trust and communication that's where the uh, sticking with the publisher goes goes from it's just about the trust you have with them Right. Okay. Because that was always the weird thing I found, like, say, with, with comics out of Japan, is a lot of times you would see in, like, the, the Western style indicia that the copyright would be attributed to the publisher, but you would never see the publishers do anything with these properties without the creator unless the publisher was a company started by the creator. Yeah, and that's effectively true because in under Japanese copyright law, the creator has to approve anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that seems like I say to the West that seems so weird because, like you say, uh, up until recently, for like our comic industry, most of most of Western nerdly arts are the same. If I want somebody to publish my stuff, I have to like basically sell them all the rights to everything I've ever done while mm-hmm. I'm under contract with them. They own anything I create mm-hmm. and they also get my firstborn son kind of thing. <laughs> if you're yep. lucky, only yeah. firstborn. So, but yeah, that, that's pretty, that explains, that explains that. Cause I, I have, yeah, it, it always did seem that the creators in Japan do have a lot more control over their works than they do here. And that just seems really, really odd because, yeah, I'm so used to the creator pretty much owns nothing except mm-hmm. hardship and uh, poverty when they get old. Right. Oh don't, oh, don't worry. I'm sure Japanese creators get plenty of hardship and poverty too. Yeah, yeah. The exchange for all that independence is no, no royalties. Okay. <laughs> Well, no, they get royalties, but I do but lower, you know, and mm-hmm. there's a lots of um, there's lots of issues about sort of how much money ends up trickling down all the way to the creator in the end. Uh, right. You know, it says is that in a way like if you give everything to a company to handle, then, you know, one company can sort of monolithically handle a lot of it. And there's less middlemen. Uh, but in Japan, there's there's always like multiple steps towards you know, there's multiple companies involved to get things finally right. published. There's the distributor, yeah. um, etc. So it depends on the industry. The light novel industry is a little little bit more lean and mean uh, than mm-hmm. some of the other like anime industry. Uh, there isn't mm-hmm. really that many companies uh, between the author and the consumer, right? There's the author, okay. there's the publisher, there's the printer, and there might be a distribution company that helps out. And, there, there, and then there's the bookstores. And that's actually it. Uh, but oftentimes mm-hmm. the publishers will even sell directly to bookstores, which is something that never happens in the U.S. There's always a distributor, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. yeah so exactly. that's why. Uh, so, for example, there's no such thing as a wholesale price in Japan. Uh, instead, mm-hmm. distribution distributors take um, don't sell things at wholesale. They uh, they take a, a fee for for their services essentially. Um, and oh, so okay. it's not like buying and buying low and selling high at each step. It's just buy. That's why there's a fixed price. And that's also why you rarely see uh, books discounted in uh, Japanese bookstores. Oh, okay. interesting. I never noticed that, but yeah, that's right. Yeah, unlike oh. North, North American bookstores, the few that are left um, that uh, do actually have stuff. Okay. Hmm. Well, actually, Sam, I think we should probably let you go because it's probably getting it's getting really late, and you, you probably got some more some work to do because that's what it means to be an independent business owner. <laughs> um, so, uh, do you have any suggestions uh, for what are uh, for what's coming up or things you think our listeners should check out that we haven't covered? Yeah, sure. So uh, to do a little bit of advertisement uh, about something that probably will have already started by the time this podcast comes out, uh, we are actually going to be starting manga as well as light novels very shortly. So uh, mm-hmm. we're going to be licensing and putting out manga. Now, some of our initial manga will actually just be adaptations of the light novels that we put out. So that'll be fun for the fans. So, for example, mm-hmm. there's a manga of Realist Hero. I don't know if you know that, uh, but we we'll, uh, but we may. I haven't announced it yet. Um, <laughs> We may be releasing that and uh, others like it uh, from the volumes that we actually 
uh, have uh, published in light novels. And then Mm -hmm. we're going to be releasing those two series that we talked briefly about. Um, Apparently, my husband has the head of a beast, or or it's my fault that my husband has the head of a beast. And uh, I've been reincarnated as a villain as my uh, All Routes Lead to Doom. Uh, Those will be coming out on ebook shortly, and those are both a hoot. So uh, Mm -hmm. if you're actually sad, you know, a little bit bored of those male. Uh, main characters uh, uh check these out these have got some really nice cool strong uh female characters in them so those are nice and right. uh yeah basically check out our website at jnovel.club and mm-hmm. uh, j-novel.club and you can read a whole bunch of free previews or check out our subscription service uh or just look and see what titles we have published and then go buy them on amazon or wherever you prefer to buy your ebooks so uh all kinds of ways to experience light novels uh and then uh, complain about them on the internet <laughs> well, that because that's what people on the internet do, absolutely. So, so thank you very much for coming on, Sam. We really appreciate it. This has been fascinating. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, and I uh, hope you guys have a nice rest of your day. Okay, thank you, and have a, have a peaceful night. Good thanks night, for listening to the show, Good night, everyone. If you'd like to hear more or join the conversation, come visit us at obeythedna.com. You can also find us on iTunes or whatever fine podcast site forgot to lock their back door. So until next time, remember that to master the nerdly arts takes time, practice, and enough Coca-Cola to drop a rhino. See ya!